crude oil is really breaking out. Um, it just, yeah, that, right. um, WTI and our model, uh, just went bullish trends. Uh, really tell me about it. Yeah. Uh, so we have crude oil trading somewhere in the $67 range to, to the high 74 range. Uh, and now it's in that high range. So it's starting to break out. Kevin Stewart, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me back on. Let's go back here. Um, two weeks, two and a half weeks to the Fed decision. They cut it 50 basis points. What's your opinion on that? And uh, how is that moving the markets? Or what does that say to your indicators that you're looking at? Yeah, a um, couple interesting things. One, I don't think the fight against inflation is done yet. I think they're hanging the banner up too quickly. Um, and this is before the port strike and all the other supply chain stuff. I just, I think inflation comes in waves and I don't think we're through that last wave yet. And I think the Fed, which everyone knows you have the dual mandate, full employment, stable prices, right? You keep those two things going. Everybody's happy. They all walking around money in their pocket. They're able to buy food. They don't rebel against the government. When you have you know, price instability, people can't buy food. You have bread lines, French revolution, Arab spring, multiple countries in Europe over the, you know, last, you know, hundred years, 200 years. So that's a huge piece of what the fed does, but they're supposed to be apolitical. And Powell's a registered Republican. His background is in private equity. Um, he's trying to leave a legacy that he slayed inflation, but I think he got a lot of pressure from the government and I have not talked to anybody. I'm not an insider. So I, this is just my personal opinion. I think the Fed is no longer apolitical. And I think that's a huge distinction. And I don't know if necessarily it's a Rubicon they crossed. If he's done after this term, I don't know if somebody would be whoever they nominate based on who wins the, the election who gets in there, maybe they change it, but just, I think the Fed, they have to work now to keep the government solvent and they have to work with the treasury to keep the, the markets, the bond markets moving. And I just think that's a really dangerous setup and looking at, you know, I watched the move index. We talked a little bit about that last time. Um, well, hold on. If you don't mind. Yeah that out a little bit more than I want to get to you what you're looking at. So uh, do you think that there was something going on that we don't know about behind the scenes here that they had to cut 50 points? Is that what you're assuming? Yeah, I think you got some pressure from Yellen. Uh, I think Yellen's been coordinating with China a little bit too. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say this in a controversial way. I'm trying to, you know, I, I think Yellen agree, disagree with her policy. She's been doing it for a long time. She's very smart. Um, I think she knew China was going to do their stimulus. And I think she was trying to, you know, do her job and protect, um, you know, our economy and market as a whole. And China's not buying a lot of our debt anymore. Um, you know, I, I wish I could remember who, but somebody posted a chart on Twitter and a lot of the biggest bond buyers or U.S. debt buyers in the past year or so have been like Luxembourg or people in Luxembourg and the Cayman Islands. And one, th those countries are very big and two, they're tax havens. So yeah, it's nice. most likely either very high net worth people who are either doing the government a favor or getting pressure or looking for a favor down the line or hedge funds getting pressure because the banks and other financial institutions can't buy as much as you know, we're just, we're exporting too much debt. And I'm curious to see if that trend continues and who's going to keep buying it because it's right. not sustainable the rate we're going. Yeah. No, you're right. Let me, uh, what, I think you're going to go into the bond market. What are, what are you looking at in the bond market? Yeah, yeah. I'm not a bond market expert by any means, but I watch the move a lot, uh, which measures the volatility, the move index, which measures the volatility. And when it gets over 120, that's usually when the dysfunction kind of starts. And then once you get up to 130, stuff really starts to break down and it starts having implications across the broad market. And um, in kind of our internal models, which we don't publish on our site, but 
you know, we have the range for that right now is 88 to 106. Um, and it's over a hundred now and it's starting to break out. So I just think that's something that people need to be mindful of. Um, let me interrupt you again. I'm yeah. sorry. You said this range of these numbers and I'm asking this just for our, our listeners and viewers. What exactly is that? Uh, so we have a, um, a proprietary model and it kind of measures a zone of where things move. Um, and we track, you know, spot commodity prices on there, things that move a little too quickly during the day to be like published as a stock ticker on our website. Um, so when I track that, that's always one thing I look at is, you know, is the high end of that zone, is it creeping up towards that 120 level or is that 120 level in the middle of that zone? Because that's kind of part of how I measure my risk, um, and how, how willing I am to put trades on like right now, probably about 70% cash. Um, I was more invested up through Wednesday and then Thursday, um, you know, yeah, the Jewish holiday, it's a light volume day. I thought the jobs report would come in hot today, but I wasn't sure, um, what the market reaction to that was going to be. So I want to take some risk off. And then also, um, with what's going on in the middle East, some of my trades were you know, in volatile areas, I didn't want to leave them on over the weekend if they start shooting at each other some more. Okay. Got it. Okay. So this is an internal indicator and you're saying it, you're seeing it at the top, top end of the range. Is that correct? Um, it's still got more room to the upside. I mean, that we measure the trend line at 104 for that. So if it hits 104, uh, that top end of that zone could probably move up more to the 110 range. And that's where I would really start paying more attention. But I mean, I, I track the move index and I also look at the 10 year yield. Um, when the move index starts going up, the 10 year yield usually starts going up too. And above 4.7, that's when we've kind of run into issues before with the general market. So right now we have the trend line for that at four. It's at, as of this morning, before we hopped on, it was at 3.95 and we had the zone for that, uh, 3.65 to 3.85. Mm -hmm. So. If it hits four, like four to four point seven, it's not a huge move. So I just think, you know, I'm not, I'm not calling a stock market crash. I'm not, you know, ringing alarm bells yet. But I just think it's something that people need to be cognizant of um, as they watch. You know, China's ripping. You go on CNBC, they're saying buy this, buy that. But I think there's some stuff starting to happen in the undercurrent that people aren't really paying close enough attention to. Got it. Okay. And again, just dialing diving deep deeper into this when that when that indicator moves up and we're approaching 110 that means the risk off trade is uh is really on correct um yeah i mean it depends on other what else is going on in the world but i mean sure the bond what, market the bond market is usually one of the things i look at if there's a lot of volatility in it, depending on which way it's moving, that's kind of, you know, I'm always trying to measure, measure my risk and measure my downside. Like, it's great if I can make money. Like I had some, you know, I use my website to run a screen and I caught the China breakout. I had one stock up 80 per, 82%, a couple up over 30%, which is great. But like, I don't know if I want to put that trade on if the volatility is really high and, you know, I, I think people sometimes are too linear in how they think and they look at a chart and they say, oh yeah, like it looks like it's breaking out. I'm going to put a hundred percent of my net worth into this one meme stock because somebody on the internet said we should buy this and they don't right. look at X. They don't look at what the U S dollar is doing. They don't look at the move index. Like it's a chess board. And I think you really got to look at, you know, I love playing chess. I used to play it all the time as a kid. Like it's great to take other people's pieces, but I don't want to lose my pieces in the process. So I right. think it's, you know, the longer you can stay in the game, you know, the more you can compile your net worth. And I'm just, you know, I'm looking to hit, not to mix metaphors here, but if I can hit singles and doubles consistently, you know, once in a while, if you have a situation like with China, I hit a home run. That's great. But I don't expect to do that every day or every week. Yeah. 
No, and you brought up, going back, you brought up a great play of just watching the bond market. That's one indicator, but just for our viewers and listeners, when I'm trading or I'm always actively looking at the bond market, that is, in my mind, that's probably the biggest indicator of a risk on or risk off trading. So um, what else are you looking at? What else is breaking out or breaking down that uh, you see in, uh, according to your indicators? Yeah, um, crude oil. Was really breaking out. Um, uh, it just yeah, right. uh, WTI and our model uh just went bullish trends. Uh really tell me about it. Yeah, uh so we have crude oil trading somewhere in the sixty-seven dollar range to to the high seventy-four range. Uh and now it's in that high range, so it's starting to break out. Um I'm not you know, I, I saw you had somebody on your show earlier in the week. You said the low is in for oil. Um, I'm thinking I agree with them right now, but I want to see some more data before I really, like I started buying oil stocks this week, um, but I always scale in and then I try to scale out of position. So I just started scaling into a couple oil companies, um, but I want to, oil's dangerous because some people trade on the geopolitical headlines. And then you have the fundamental to go with it. And if the geopolitical part of that trade is Iran and Israel going at it, again, I'm not an expert, but if they stop shooting at each other over the next two weeks or not, does oil go back down to 65? Or is oil being driven right now by demand of China um, growing its economy and, and doing stimulus to create demand? And India's booming. I mean, there's a lot of emerging market companies that are really doing well. Um, but again, I want to see that oil trade be more fundamentally driven and not, you know, people watching the news saying, oh, somebody launched a missile at somebody, the oil's going to go to a hundred, let's buy oil. Yeah. That is a great point. Typically I, especially with oil, but just about anything, I don't want to play the news in the sense of, you know what I mean? In the sense of, Something's starting to run because whether it's conflict or whether even it's the news of uh, a stimulus, I'm not going to play that move, if you would. I could jump in, but I want to see, I just want to see the dust settle and see where we're at. So that's a great point. Great yeah. Point. If, you're, if your investing process is chasing headlines, you won't stay in this game very long. Like no. it's too hard. It, it's just but, way too hard and there's way too many smart people in it. And the machines you're trading against are way smarter than you if you don't have a process and that's where i think it gets i think it gets really dangerous really quickly if, if you don't have a process and you just trade on narratives yep got it let's talk more uh, about some commodities here and um in light of the fed's bomb and i wasn't trading specifically the fed but i have uh, added to positions uh recently in the gold market what, what do you see in commodities and specifically gold Gold, I'm sensing a little weakness here. Um, I am too. Silver, like gold just had a MACD breakdown. Um, silver, um, spot silver in our internal model just got rejected at the top end of its zone today. Um, and has a little bit, I could see that going back down to 30. Um, copper seems to be doing well here. It's kind of starting to hit some chop in the middle of its zone. Um, but... I, I took off some of my gold positions this week. I still have a couple left, but I, I've rotated my China gains and some of my gold gains out, and I'm starting to deploy those slowly um, into oil and to, into more copper stuff too. Interesting. I'm starting to nibble on crude. I did add, and maybe I did add because of the news, but it was a long-term trade, if you would, and is a long-term trade. Um, I do too see some weakness in gold, or I don't want to say I see some weakness. It's just, we're just, we've run really hard, really fast. Yeah. And, and I'm still bullish at long-term. Like I think it's sniffing out, um, not only the inflation piece, but I think also, you know, the possible U S default somewhere down the road. Cause we're just, we're at the point in no return. I mean, I, some stat I read, like once your debt to GDP gets over 130%, no country's ever recovered from that. And we're, I think, well beyond that point. I've seen some people say we're at 140 or even 150 now. And I'm curious to see how the Fed's going to manage that. And 
I thought, you know, a couple of years ago when inflation was running hot, I thought, okay, this is, and I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but I thought, hey, maybe this is a chance for the government. They're trying to kind of have a release valve because they know they've overspent and they're going to try to get inflation up and maybe they'll curtail their spending a little bit and they'll get that g- debt to GDP. I was thinking they're going to try to get back to like 80 or 90% when we're at that 120 line and we just kept yeah got it um todd talk to me about just general equities the s p um what are you looking at and what do you see there yeah um you want me to share my screen here and yeah please uh, uh so this is i'll go here This is our main page um, here, SPY is down here. Um, So SPY, we're still bullish. I actually do own some of this in both my retirement account and my trading account right now. A little bit of support at 564, but not much overhead resistance. So we had a good run here. So I wouldn't be surprised if it consolidates for a little bit um, before it tries to, you know, start another uptrend. If, you know, if the bond market, doesn't do what I worry it could do. And, you know, the VIX stays low. I think, you know, there could be a chance, you know, for general equities to keep rising here. Yeah. What do you think of the theory? And this is something I'm um, very sympathetic to. If we don't get in any kind of meaningful pullback here, if if we just stay here in the S&P, trade this range, we're going to probably, we're going to probably run until January, maybe mid-January. What do you think of that theory? I could see that. I mean, who knows if they revise the jobs report down like they've been doing. Uh, yeah, right. They come out with a good number and then a month later, like, oh, actually it was, you know, 30 grand or 30,000 people less employed. No big deal. Um, so I think there's a chance it could keep running higher um, depending on what happens in the Middle East. Um, I think Ukraine and Russia is... Sure. You know, I think that kind of is a stalemate either way right now. So I don't see any, you know, you could always have a random black swan event, but I think, you know, with the Fed cutting, I think, you know, employment numbers are good. Um, You know, if oil rips and gets to a hundred, then I could see that starting to slow things down for the general economy. Um, But I don't see that yet in oil. I think it'll be an incremental step up higher um, in the short term. Right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, anything else that looks interesting that you wanted to share here? Yeah. Um, I wanted to show some, so this is SIL. This is a silver miners ETF. Um, we still have it very bullish. I mean, I, I like silver here more than gold. Um, but this again is in a danger zone. 35.62 was the close yesterday. Um, 35.93 is Resistance 35.55 is support. Um, and there's not any big numbers. So I don't really have a conviction either way of where this trades. Like in our own internal model, Spot Silver just got rejected at the top of its zone. So I could see this pulling back to the 34 level, um, maybe even 32. Um, but GDX is a little more interesting. Um, 39.56 close and resistance a little under 40 of 11. So that's more of a medium resistance. So I think that could be some short-term resistance. And if you look at the chart, it's a little stretch that there's not much meaningful support until you get down to the 38, 37, 36. You got it. Um, CopEx, I just, I got out of this yesterday. Just, I wanted to mark a win and um, I saw this 10 number pop up. And I'm not really sure which way this is going to go in the short term. I mean, if you look at that run from a little under, you know, 38, 39 to almost 50. That's a good run. Yeah. I mean, I caught most of that. I think, you know, in September I made, I think I locked in a swing trade. I made 8.5% on CopEx. So I was really happy with that trade. Um, But I think it, in the long run, I think it would be better if it consolidated for a little bit. Um, cause it is, you know, support at 46, like that's a good number, 44, 43, like it's not that the chart is too stretched, but I think it could use a little sideways action maybe for a week or two. Got it. 
Yeah. Um, I bought some, this is Exxon. I bought some of this earlier this week. I'm starting to scale into it. Um, you see some good support at 113, 115. I mean, those are some decent numbers all the way up and the resistance on it is not very high. Um, mm -hmm. XOM's a big component of the XLE ETF. Um, so some of the other oil stocks in the XLE ETF, I don't love right now. So, you know, normally I like to play the ETFs, but here I'm like, if I'm going to play oil, I think I'm just gonna, I might just play straight eggs on, um, in the short term until, you know, if I get a confirmation signal on, you know, what I'm thinking oil is going to do, then I'd be more willing to, to wade into the XLE ETF. Um, uh, this was really interesting. So this is UGA, this is us gasoline, even though it's neutral right now, um, Look at that support number, 62.14, 33 confluence. That's very high. So got it. I got it's in. How much? Yep. So I got in there um, and I'm watching that. Like 67 is nine's a medium level number. Um, so it might take a little bit of time to get through 67, but that 33 is a very solid support number. Um, and if it broke below that, I wouldn't stay in it. Um, but you know, as I start to rotate out of other stuff, I need somewhere to put my money. And I think oil in the short term could be a good, um, bet. Um, I would agree. I would agree. Ed Nico ego. Oh no. I didn't mean to do that. Um, I was in this stock. Um, I sold it, I think Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, once this 16 number popped up, so it's a little under 80 bucks right now and the resistance to 80.75, the 16 confluence, that could hold it for a bit. Um, so I think, you know, Ed Nico's had a really good year. I've done a really good job trading it back and forth. Um, so I think this could do for a little consolidation right here, um, but it's still one of my favorite. You know, I think it's a really well run mining company. Um, and they bought Kirkland Lake, which is one of the best stocks I've ever bought. So I'm definitely going to keep an eye on it, but I'm, I'm watching that resistance level. Uh, yeah. we talked about box last time I was on, I bought that in the 275, 270 range. That's still bullish. Um, I still own it. Um, I think they're set up to do really well in the long term. Um, I have some of my retirement account and my training account. Um, but. I'm curious to see if gold pulls back. Um, I mean, it's at three people one. That's a big, that's a big range right there. So I'm very curious as to how that goes. Yeah. Um, this is our, um, stock screen page or no, sorry, watch list page and you can build your own watch list. So I have a ton of watch lists on here, but, um, so oil, you start to see some bullish stuff in the Starts short screen. Yep. Um, which wasn't that way in the past couple of weeks. Um, so there's, I think there's some opportunity in the oil sector. Um, but again, I want to see some confirmation that it's more, um, you know, fundamentally driven because of demand and not a headline trade. Right. Excellent, man. Okay. Anything you want to, uh, share here over the next uh, couple of weeks before I, you have, I have you on again, what do, uh, traders need to look out for? Um, I think just what we talked about earlier, um, I think watch the bond market, watch the VIX, um, at a really good September, um, I won 80% of my trades, 87% of my trades in September. Um, uh, my average gain was 15.28%. Um, taking a little bit of a breather right now. Cause I just kind of want to watch and see, um, how things go. Um, like I said, I'm probably 70 to 75% in cash right now in my trading account. Um, so wait, I want to see how the jobs report was this week, uh, this today, um, see how the dust settles over the weekends. And then I'm, I'm watching oil closely, um, watching copper, silver, gold closely. Um, the agriculture ETFs have run a lot. Um, I didn't chase those, but I'm curious to see, um, you know, if they're going to pull back, they consolidate. If I can get a good entry point there, I might. Um, but I'm trying to, you know, try to stay disciplined because if you chase big moves and you get at the end, mean reversion really sucks. And then, yeah. you know, next thing you know, you're down 8, 10% in a trade and you're kicking yourself because you know you shouldn't have chased and you're wondering, like, do I ride it out 
am I stuck in this in three months? Do I just write it off and take some ta tax loss harvest? Like, I, I don't like put myself in those situations. So, you know, if, if I have a good month, which thankfully I did in September, usually I kind of like to kind of wait and watch the dust settle for, you know, a couple of days or a week before I really figure out what I'm going to do next. Got it. Uh, Kevin, I'm becoming a big fan of your work and your site. If people want to, um, get in touch with you or, um, use your services, tell us a little bit about that and how do they do that? Yeah. Um, uh, so if you go to stockta.com, um, uh, you can sign up, create a free account. Um, sorry, over here, you can sign in, create an account, uh, that allows you to do watch lists to save stock screens. Um, uh, we are on Twitter. Uh, the handle is, um, at stock T A D O T com. Um, and then I did just start a YouTube channel, um, last week at stock T A. And if you go to the main page of that, I have a video section that, um, has some how to videos and explains how to kind of use the site, how our analysis works, what it means and, you know, how to create watch lists, how to make a stock screen and, you know, how to really get the most out of the website. Excellent. I will link to all of this, including your YouTube channel in the show notes uh, below. Uh, Kevin, I always appreciate, thank you so much for your time and uh, hopefully I'll have you on again the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you so much for having me on and um, I, I hope your listeners have uh, some good luck trading in the next couple of weeks. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Take care. See ya.